Good evening, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you so much for coming tonight and for filling out all those horrible surveys, for letting me do science with you. We are here for the study titled Being in Concert, Audience Motion and Emotion, which I am conducting at in Norway, actually. Now, you just experienced a concert, and concerts have lots of things going on, including performers who are interacting and an audience who interacts, and the performers and the audience interact with music at the center of that interaction. Now, the audience might be fans of the performers, um, and there's often, in addition to the music, also lights and maybe even pyrotechnics, and also the audience and performers might be under the influence of mind-altering substances. Um, at least that's true for some genres, and also there might be motion. But in other genres, uh, things might be a little different. There is maybe less pyrotechnics, different kinds of mind-altering substances, and also qualitatively and quantitatively different types of motion. So why am I measuring concert audiences? Well, concerts are culturally important, socially complex phenomena. They're real-world examples of music listening and participation, and anyone can be an audience member or a study participant. There are a variety of norms across different cultures and genres, and therefore, in my opinion, they're the perfect setting to further understand embodied music cognition and social psychology. For those of you that don't know, music cognition refers to the mental actions or processes involved with music, and embodied music cognition really places an emphasis on the role of the body in the study of musical interactions. This is me, circa 2012, at the very end of high school. Music was my life. I did, stayed every day after school, I was involved in all sorts of things, and at the end of high school, I, like, I also had a passion for biology, and I was good at math, and I really loved physics and sound, and so when I had to decide what I was going to do next, I was so excited when I learned about the Live Lab, which was actually completed in 2012. So when I learned about McMaster's music cognition program, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So I was actually the second undergraduate student here at the Live Lab and did one of the first research projects here, the physiological underpinnings of Groove. And we got up to a lot of shenanigans, preparing the space and dealing with the 100 tablet response system, learning about motion capture and also brainwave measuring technologies like EEG, sorry, electroencephalography. And so it was a great time. Uh, and at the same time, I was also performing in the Greater Hamilton music scene and started up my band, Dana and the Monsters Under the Bed, uh, now rebranded as just Dana and the Monsters. Um, but for me, there was something always that was so special about live music and live performance, performances, both as a performer, but also as an audience member. And with much thanks to Professor Matthew Woolhouse and Jody Bonsall, Ian Fletcher Thornley performed his album release in the Live Lab back in 2015. We recorded audience head motion capture from two audiences with both fans and neutral listeners. One listened to the live album release concert and the other listened to the pre-recorded album. Here is an example of what maybe you also looked like this evening with those motion capture caps. the breakdown and you'll see the head start to move more in sync very shortly. So don't worry, I'll make a graphic just like this of all of you. So the culmination of that project was my undergraduate thesis, which was titled Rock Stars versus Records, the Influence of Performer Presence on Audience Movement. We published a paper three years later um, in Frontiers in Psychology, and we found that the live audience moved more than the audience listening to the album, and fans moved more and more in time to the music than neutral listeners. But why and what does this movement really mean and represent? The fans had never heard these songs before, so how was it they, they were better able to predict where the beat came? Or could it have been that they actually were somehow signaling that they were part of a group? 
Also at Mac, I was really involved in this club called MacBeat. We met once a week to jam, and it, this was my entire social network. I loved MacBeat and became the president. We'd go all the time, we'd organize all kinds of music. And through my own experiences, I knew that jamming with people helped bring us together, that moving with people helped to connect us. And actually, I also discovered from the music cognition literature that music promotes social bonding. And this at MacBeat is also where I met Alex. And uh, some professors, including Dr. L Laurel Trainer, believe that music actually may have evolved because of its social bonding functions. And we know, we think this because it presents early in development. Children as young as 14 months old also show these uh, effects of musical bonding. And it happens cross-culturally. And recently there was a review paper that outlined all of the reasons in which they think that music is a co-evolved system for social bonding. And through this quote here, I was inspired to have this research project. We also predict that participatory musical performances will have significantly stronger effects than either non-participatory or solo musical experiences. So this evening, my research question was how does active participation influence motion, emotion and pleasure, and social bonding at a concert? And we did this in two songs, songs four and eight, where Alex encouraged you to clap along and sing along. We predicted that active participation would result in more coordinated motion, more engagement, and more connectedness among the audience and the performer. We, um, last October, we also ran a very similar concert experiment in a classical concert setting with the Danish String Quartet in Copenhagen in Denmark. We measured the emotions of feeling moved and absorption and awe at this classical concert using the Music Lab app and surveys, just like what we did today. And we found that feeling moved and touched, awe, absorption, and connectedness to the performer and musicians were all correlated and interrelated. And so what's amazing about this concert experiment is now it will allow us to compare across genres and across cultures whether we see the same things tonight. For me also, tonight was a test of whether musicians and scientists can work together. I think this is so important because it's um, really crucial in music cognition that we work together with musicians. And so I asked Alex, what do you want to know about your audience? And she replied, I'd be curious to know if they associate any songs with their own life experiences or memories, if a song reminds them of something or creates a picture in their imagination. And so I added in these survey questions because of Alex's specific request, and I cannot wait to go through the data with her and show her which songs really evoked these memories and visual imagery in you. So thank you so much for listening to my science snapshot. The real title of my thesis is actually Audience Motion, Emotion, and Social Bonding. And if you want, I was not able to cover everything that we've done tonight. So stay tuned to Twitter or LinkedIn or send me an email if you want to receive the results of this and other research that I'm conducting. Or you can also follow the InSync Lab, and that's Jona Voskoski, my supervisor in Norway. Also, you can follow RITMO, which is the center that I work at in Oslo. And I want to give a special thanks to the team involved with the Music Lab app, Pedro Pablo Lucas Bravo, Kayla Burnham, Finn Upham, and Alexander Refsom Yensenius. And a huge thanks to the crew here at the Live Lab. This would literally not have been able to happen without these amazing people. To my old colleagues and dear friends, Susan Marshrollo and Dan Bosniak, thank you so much. And to new friends, Sally Stafford and Hani Taufik, thank you so much for helping me with this project. It's thanks to you. Thank you. I, yes. <laughs> I'm extremely excited as well now because we are going to do more music for you and I get to play with Alex Warms and her band. And I am going to invite them back out shortly. <gasps> Here they are. I'm gonna also close this curtain.
Sorry, my heart just started racing because I got nervous all of a sudden. Give me one second here, folks. Because I wanted to talk a bit about our relationship because I just had the most brilliant interview with her after the, at the intermission. And I'm so excited to dig into this data. And yeah, I just wanted to mention that you once told me that I was who inspired you to start gigging. And I just wanted to say, wow, the inspirer has become the inspired. Thank you so much, Alex. Everybody give it up again once more for her. I wrote this first song when I was on a bus ride back from a heartbreak in Hamilton, so an HSR bus. It's called No Love Left, and it was arranged with my bassist, Ethan Tilbury, which is part of the reason why Conrad Sverchek will be featured in this song. <laughs> and I'll let you take it away as I get water. There's a devil in my garden in this garden love Turning my violets into violence And my puppies into drugs I'm addicted to this sadness So addicted to this lust He's stealing all my smiles And slowly stealing all my love When this potion wears over In darkness I begin Burns out in darkness, I scream. No hell, no hope, no love left for me. There's a demon in these waters, in these waters of peace, taking my healthy blue, choking it to ivy green. You say you wanna talk, but no talking I can do. I'll just run from the devil and run from the demon and run away from you. And when this wrong sobers up, only pain I will see. No help, no hope, no love left for only. When this high comes down or drugs I will need. No help, no hope, no love left. myself no more blaming others for what it become it's time to change all on my own and when this sickness leaves all alone i will be no help no home no love left for old me when sadness goes away all alone i will stay no help no hope no love left for old me
Hamilton is known as the city of waterfalls. Did you know that? <laughs> I once got a little lost on my way somewhere in Hamilton, and it was a crisp, cool fall morning with the trees that were red and orange and falling, and there was a mist, and I was walking along, actually like struggling to find my way, looking at my phone, when all of a sudden, a waterfall like, emerged out of the mist, and it was Sherman's Falls, and I was just mind blown and so grateful that nature had brought me back to the present and the now. This next song is called Waterfall. Poseidon's kiss Sprinkle your soul surface over me Swallow me whole Pray no one knows How far our love flows to the sea Pull me straight down And please swirl me around Like nature's washing machine Took my body with him, my soul will stay. Everyone, it is now, now your chance to join in again and participate and feel that amazing connectedness. Just repeat after me, it's very simple. Him, my soul will stay sparkling mist. 
stole Poseidon's kiss Sprinkle your soul surface over me Swallow me whole and burn No one knows how far love goes to the sea Pull me straight down and please swirl me around Like nature's washing machine I just want to say a huge thanks again to the band for even learning these songs. You guys are absolutely amazing. Please, again, give it up for Conrad Sverchek, <laughs> Nigel Stewart, and Stephen Orr, and of course, Alex Warms. This is the last song of the evening, and it's called Cinnamon, and it's actually about wanting what you cannot have. Not many people know this, but I actually named it as a pun. It's meant to be like Sinner Man. You see that? I have never told that to an audience before. I know. I think I told Alex once. Knew, and because you reacted yeah, so yeah. positive, I was like, I guess this isn't too weird that it's called Sinner Man. But um, <laughs> I uh, wanted to mention how much I love cinnamon. I love it a lot. But did you know you're actually only supposed to have one teaspoon a day? But sometimes I indulge and I have a bit more. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> Did you really think I wouldn't notice The way your eyes pierced through mine? Did you really think I would include it The way you treat me so divine? I know it shouldn't be happening But life and love ain't fair Cinnamon don't get no closer unless you can take the punishment. Spice me with your sin, cheat me with your season, love me with your looks, and pour honey on your reasons. Hold me with your tongue, love me with your fingers, hold me with your soul, touch me a little linger. You're my cinnamon, you sing so many ways, you make me feel. So bad it hurts But don't forget your place Wrap your arms around me Pull me close and let me go I want you to tease me Want you to please me Tie me up, unleash my soul Myself in temptation shivers up my spine Cinnamon, you are all sensation Send me so sublime Whoa. Spice me with your food Cheat me with your season Love me with your lips And pour honey on your reasons Roll me with your tongue Love me with your fingers Hold me with your soul Touch me, let it linger
Conrad Sparacek. Son, touch me, let it linger. <gasps> You're my cylinder, seen so many ways. You make me feel real good inside. Yeah, yeah. Make me wanna scream your name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're my cylinder, you seen so many ways. I want this so bad it hurts. Did you play? Yeah, yeah. in our Live Lab concert series up next on October 21st in collaboration with MIM graduate students and the Canadian Chopin Society is another research concert in the series. Also, afterwards, join us in the lobby for the meet and greet with Alex Worms and band. And please remember to check your emails on September 30th for the one week after concert follow-up survey. We hope you've had a wonderful evening tonight. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs>